Hello, today I want to look at something that flows on quite naturally from what we've been looking at before, but in a way can also be confusing. That's the idea of articulated, articulated far lead. And that can be confusing because before I talked about, in previous, the video probably before this, I talked about the idea of articulating force, of getting more body movement behind a strike. So the, the terms can sometimes be confusing because we use the same idea when we say we're just hitting like this as differentiated from using this kind of screwing force. We call that articulated far lead because it's the same It's the same idea that you're using the, the movement of muscle, so we call it articulated movement. But we also have another another name for this. When, when we're doing push hands, we call it kinking. So we just kink the, kink the movement like that. And it's also related to our, our idea of structural expansion and structural contraction. And we haven't looked at structural contraction, so we can kind of include it in, in this. Therefore, what I want to do is express that there's, there's all these different ways of using the body to generate force, and we're not limited to one kind of way of doing that. Far Lee is the overall concept, and everything's kind of feeding into Far Lee as a, as a movement principle. But we're not limited to just using, for example, screwing force, which is incredibly important. We use it for, for so many different things. There's other ways of generating force, and sometimes they're more useful or they involve screwing force or they compound with screwing force. So we can say this, this is what we call kinking or articulated far lead, where you just hit him like that. But you can also do it like, like that. Like when you, this classic movement when we take down someone's guard, like, like that, that uses screwing force and articulated, articulated far lead like that. But I'll call it kinking, I'll call it kinking anyway from now on because it's, it's just, it helps to differentiate from the idea when we use, for example, short power and we articulate the, the muscle and bone structure into the, behind the posture to get more power and that can be confusing using those two terms for the same, even though they are, they are really the same thing but we differentiate them in, in the way that they're practised. One's usually just, when we say articulated farly, we usually just mean like one joint is moving like that. Whereas articulated power, we usually mean like what we call somatic flow, that there's a lot of there's a lot of bodily articulation behind the punch. And there's a few interesting things to think about around this and a few historical interesting things to think about and where this comes from. So we can start drawing in some of the other the other antecedents of each one, particularly White Crane and Liuha Bafa. So if we look at white crane, first of all, and think about it's, it's very strong use of this kind of kinking articulated, single articulation movement like this, this kind of, this kind of movement. It's, it's very much based around a kind, a different kind of isometric training that we're normally used to in each one. So that also points to, as I've talked about before, that when we say isometric training, for one thing that doesn't really cover, it's too limited a term to cover the, the things that we do within each one, but isometric itself, a lot of different ways of moving, including, for example, isometric postures in stillness and isometric postures in movement, which are two different things. But White Crane usually uses very strong isometric movements so or very strong tension of the of the body. And this is very much characteristic of southern boxing, using this very where you really tense the muscles like as a kind of special kind of almost like it's not weight training, it's isometric training obviously, but it's a kind of muscle strengthening training you wouldn't necessarily even though the forms are very often done with isometric, this very tense isometric training, usually the movement isn't necessarily done like that in practice. But White Crane uses this very strong, this very strong kind of isometric movement to get these single joint or double joint movements like that on these angular, so in and out like. Um, Bit of white crane for you there. Uh, it's actually not. It's actually a bit, bit of hunger for you. And of course, Wang Shengjai was exposed to this this idea, and also the other idea of the way that the white crane uses Farley, very very much like 
Well, well, it's described as the, the being very similar to a dog shaking off water. So there's a few examples of that that we know of that are quite famous. This kind of shaking posture, and that that is very much related to our somatic timing kind of movement that we've looked at before. That very much comes into that movement. You can see where that comes from. So if you've got this kind of um, this kind of shaking movement, and then within that shaking movement is the is the somatic bounce of the muscles because you tense and then relax. But if you change that into like I'm hitting out with my forearm, that's very much related to that that kind of movement. But we've also got the way that force is used in white crane, very often using this movement round the axis like this kind of this kind of move around the axis I can't do it so but we're not so much concerned with that today we can maybe come back to that that another time and think about that but it but it's very much in the the nature of the movement of this kind of very tense use of isometric isometric training that you try and get that and, and it's something that you can get in white crane because if you're tensing the whole body so much, you can transmit that. You can transmit that force through the body because because it, because it's very very tense. And that's I'm going to start speaking now to this idea of the doctrine of the meme because we've talked about the idea that the tenser the tenser the body is, the more that it can transmit the force. So if I, if our I mean, in, in essence, each one is an incredibly simple idea. It's just like we generate force through Farley, through fast movement. So, so for example, around the axis like that, hitting him with a forearm, or maybe hitting back like, like that. We generate Farley around the axis with a short, sharp movement, and we need to then transmit that to the contact point, to the hit point. So the level of body consistency, how tense or relaxed and how integrated we are, well, I mean, really, we're doing it through tension, aren't we? We're doing it through body tension interlinking different parts of the body together. But we're trying to get that tension in exactly the right proportion to transmit the force that we're generating from Farley to the contact point. And to get it to the contact point also requires the way that we stack the posture, the way that it's structured, the way that it's rooted to the floor to solidify the, the posture and just some way of directing the... This is the this is the hit point. Usually, as you can see in each one, there's usually more than one hit point. So when you do that, is this the hit point, or is this the hit point back here, or is is this the hit point or here, or the back of my? These are all releasing force one way or another. But the way that we stack the posture, which will include like the way it kind of leans to one side, that will help to direct the most of the force to one point through this kind of solid structure and again it's just a law of physics the structure is solid so it transmits the force if the structure is floppy we can we can get if it's floppy we can get whipping more like kind of whip like movement and this is this kind of <laughs> i'm doing it big enough because i've just seen a video of someone doing it really big like that and we talked about when you do this kind of posture it puts so much strain on the that it dissipates a lot of the structural link. So like in Shingi Chuan, you have this very strong structural link back into the body. If you start doing it like this, you lose that, you dissipate it here, but you compensate for it in the in the kind of the speed of the movement that you can get like, like that. So all different ways of using the structure and the way that the body is stacked. So these are just different ways of stacking the posture. Stack it like that, you put like a lot of strain on the elbow, dissipate a lot of force stack it like that you can get the energy going back into the body and it's more solidified and then everything else is just about how we maximize all of those things that's that's it really i mean the, the the only addition really is we don't always just want to release force sometimes we want to use guiding force to move people which is another use of the way of the way that we use uh our configuration in motion and once you've got that, once you've got that, that's each one. That's the essential idea of each one. And everything else is just about the technicalities of how you do that and the context of the reality of the fight and the problematic that we try to solve with each individual movement. And we talked about the idea that you need it, like in each one, the consistency, the consistency of movement when we hit, it's it's not 100% tense. So there's, there's, there's 
flexibility in the movement and particularly when we're moving into the movement that we're kind of 50 50 we're going for this 50 50 relaxation and tension and that's how we get the correct consistency of the body that links the, the body together and he's able to transmit the force just just through a perfectly normal law of physics that just by making the, the structure more solid and we just do that through muscle contraction it's as simple as that and as complicated as that muscle contraction but on a very fine integrated level and that's why it's got to be controlled by an overall supercomputer that's operating in a very different way to the way that the brain normally manages the, the levels of structural tension throughout the body we're training that and usually we've got this kind of springy springiness to it when we hit and we're just for a split second tense and that's very very different to white crane so white crane has this very isometric <laughs> so I can't help but do it like a tenser version of each one and that's that's by the way how you vibrate so when you do vibration skill it's actually not like the, usually we have this kind of doctrine of the mean 50 50 relaxation and tension and it's somewhere in the middle when you vibrate it's a very different way of thinking about the doctrine of the mean where you're going from as tense as you can be pretty much to as relaxed as you can be but you try to do it like oscillating very very fast that's the vibration speed you're oscillating between relaxation and tension i can feel it in my body it's a very different way of thinking about the doctrine of the mean i'm not trying to find a balance i'm trying to shift from one extreme to the other and that's how you get this vibration can you see it I'll just keep it still into the front of the camera it's kind of vibration yeah you can see that it's just oscillating it's oscillating between relaxation and tension that's all but in white crane you have this very tense the training method itself is like your body is your gym so it's very tense and even when it changes to it keeps this very tense this very tense movement so that's would be considered like like the way that Wang Sheng Jai looks at it it's too extreme but what it does do is it allows that in the moment the way that far Li is used is used in white crane the transmission of force because the body is tense the body is tense it can transmit force and this is the it's like the mystery that Wang Sheng Jai is looking at and I've talked before about like creativity and being creative and we're bombarded by stuff and it's still hard to be creative we're bombarded by vast amounts of information and the different ways of being creative so one of the ways is like back in the day you know in in you're in China or anywhere in the world in fact and you're thinking about how to be creative and you're just being inspired by things like the weather or animals and things like that that's just like you know a classical musician right you know composition about the four different weather seasons or something like that is the same idea as someone thinking about well, how does an eagle move you know i want to i want to bit of eagle claw flight and copying that and being creative like that and another way of being creative is, is to put things together so you don't even have to create anything new you just put two things together and, and find an interesting combination between those two so that happens in music all the time you can think of examples yourself different genres being put together you don't have to create anything new you just put those two genres together and bob's your uncle you've created a new genre for better or for worse you've created something new put heavy metal together with rap and you've got rock rap or something like that and you've got a whole new got a whole new thing to sell and make money out of and if you're particularly a genius at the thing that you do like Wang Shang Jai then you can take multiple things and put them together and start thinking about how they interlink and this is where this starts this starts coming into each one where Wang Shang Jai takes this idea and you can see like it's 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 quite similar in many ways to to Xing Yi Chuan release of force but you've got this very highly articulated movement in in white crane that you don't have in the same you don't see that in the same way in Xing Yi Chuan but you do have this very tense ability to release force with this this energy of a dog shaking off water um, I don't want to do it because I don't do white cream 
if you tense if you tense the body very much you can get this transmission of force and it, and it teaches you in many ways like all ah, right that's what's going on isn't it so it, it teaches you that but then it's too stiff so from Wang Chen Jai's perspective it's the movement itself is too is too stiff in the in the posture and at the same time of course there's another really massive influence on Wang Chen Jai and that's from Yu He Ba Fa and Yu He Ba Fa is a very interesting style. It's very easily confused with Tai Chi. It's a very similar concept to Tai Chi. Think if if anything like like when we say Tai Chi, I, I always think like Wang Shang Jia was probably much more exposed to Yang Tai Chi than Chen Tai Chi. So whereas my my paradigm is always I always think about Chen Tai Chi when I think about Tai Chi. So I have to try and put myself in Wang Shang Jia's mind and think about Yang Tai Chi that that he was probably more familiar to, more exposed to. And Chen Tai Chi, uh, Tai Chi, Tai Chi Chen tends to have like a lot more small joint articulation in the in the movement than Liu He Ba Fa, which tends to be much more kind of limby. And it, takes up, it takes up more space with the limb. It's like got this big circle around it. Um, I don't, I don't know the user that far, so I'm just I'm going by the videos that I've seen, and it's not, it's not that easy to find someone who's good at the user that far who isn't like ninety. <laughs> There's plenty of like old masters who are ancient that like, have kind of been captured in that that survey of Wushu that was done by the, the government in China in in the eighties or whatever. But there's not so many that you see where you think that's outstanding. Liu He Ba Fa now, or, 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 or I haven't seen that anyway. So, but it tends to be more limmy. It's bigger. It takes up more movement, and it's much closer as we're going to see to this kind of movement in each one where we start doing Jian Wu. And you can see what happens here. So, like, like Tai Chi has got this much more small joint articulation, just like, just like White Crane's got this very much. This kind of movement, which is very good for, you know, just working with when you're in contact with someone's, someone's hand, because it uses this this kink type farley, this very this small joint articulation of movement, which is a way of generating power from almost nothing, particularly when you bring in better body movement like whole body articulation, and that's what's wrong with I think. White Crane from Wang Shangjai's perspective that the power is good. Like this, this power of the dog shaking off water, the very stiff movement. So let's say your arms are on someone else's arms and you want to just do, you want to just do that. And it tends to use not oppositional force. It tends to use just using the same direction like, like that to get the, if there's any movement at all in the far lead, it just tends to be rotational rotational farley or sometimes sometimes that but I think I'm just putting that in because that's what I do. It tends to use this rotational farley more than anything else so you, you, like in white crane you don't see that much like moving forward like that kind of movement. It tends to be this kind of movement around the axis and very very tense and because of the tension in the movement because of the philosophy the, the the sport science principle of white crane that relies on this very high level of isometric tension in the body it makes it very very difficult to get the bigger kind of articulated power that we've looked at so you know for example you can do like let's say i'm going to do this movement like white crane this one one two like because of the tension in the body, it tends to be like a very blocky. You can go look at White Crane and see how they move like this. It's very robotic, very blocky. Whole body moves as one, so you can say this really speaks to the complexity of this idea of whole body connectivity and some of the glass theory, particularly in each one that's talked about whole body connectivity. One whole body moves, one whole body moves into the punch. Whole body moves into the punch and moves round the round the centre line like that. Where, where it has movement round like Farley, it tends to be round the centre line. Or or it's just compensatory force where it's just moving 
forward like that kind of movement. So what it doesn't have then is the kind of articulated movement that 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 we think about now in each one. So if I want to do that, for one thing, I'm not going to do it usually. I mean, I might that way, but if I think about like the overall paradigm of each one that you want to maximize power. And so we start using much more oppositional force and understanding this paradox that oppositional force tends to create more real power, not fantasy power. Um, that it's actually more powerful to go that way with the rotational folly and use oppositional force like that. And then I can use articulated force rather than going one, two, like a robot. I can use one, two, like this. I'm really exaggerating so you can see it like one, and then articulate into the, into the punch like that. And then it starts getting so fast that you can't actually see the movement. The problem is with like some of the older, some of the older each one masters, they really exaggerate, I've said before, they really exaggerate the somatic timing. They make it a lot bigger. So you can see the movement a lot easier. Like going, and you can see that like that. Now I would say that's we've kind of moved on from that. It's, it's a little bit too slow because people have learned that. It's always standing on the shoulders of giants. People who learned that could then, instead of like taking 20 years to learn that like they did, that can be learned in a year. And then you can move forward with that a lot quicker and just imp and improve it. Just that people worship the past. It's like Zhao Daozin says, people worship the past. If it's done like that in the past, people think it must be the best way. But... Um, Wang Shunjai said it's got to keep improving every generation every generation has got to keep improving and if we're completely honest the problem is that a lot of the people who are training in each one aren't interested in each one as a kind of fight science they're only interested in buying into something that gives them some kind of identity it's like kind of buying into being an aristocrat or something like you want to buy into the title the so-called lineage the the meaningless title is exactly like being an, an aristocrat, isn't it? Like a, a lineage with a family tree and you're all given these titles. You might as well just call yourself Baron or something like that. And, and that in some sense is supposed to elevate you as what? A superior just because? No, no. It's supposed to improve each generation. So this movement, we can get, we can get it smaller now. If, if your level is high enough, you can get it smaller rather than the, you might see from the old, oh, I can't really hurt my neck doing that. You can see the old, each one master's doing like a much bigger, much bigger articulation, much bigger use of the somatic timing. It's not just a stylistic thing, it's the, the reality of the fight and getting it, getting that movement. And that's why you don't really see, for the most part, people who are, come from Yao's each one doing that. You don't see that kind of thing for the most part. Because Yao Zong's unrecognised, you've got to just get that somatic timing under control and just make the movements more economical. The point being anyway, that in, in Yong Chun, you can't get that. Um, the, the movement itself mitigates this very articulated kind of movement. Whereas in Tai Chi and Yu He Ba Fa, you very much have this articulated kind of movement. So different, like, like... As we know, like Tai Chi is very phased, like and this kind of one, two, the shoulder goes first in the body, the arm falls on the shoulder, that kind of phased movement, which is what leads into articulated force in each one, different parts of the body working behind the scenes to get power in what looks like a small movement. So from combining those two together, from looking at Liu He Ba Fa, and it's, and it's kind of very limby, limb-like, big limb Tai Chi style movements. And a little bit from Tai Chi, I think, as well. And then fusing that together very creatively with, with white crane and this very harsh articulated single joint articulation movement, you create a hybrid. 
And look, what, what, what do we get? We've got this very flowing movement from the Uhe Bafar. I'm just pretending to know the Uhe Bafar, but you can go and see it's very flowing, big limb movement. Very much like Tai Chi, but just bigger. And combining that with the this very harsh, isometric posture concept from White Crane. Um, getting a bit... See, the crane I know is, is from something else. It's from it's from uh, Hungar, so I just I, I always just start adding in little bits. By combining those two together, look what you get straight away. What you, what what you create straight away, you create Jamu, just as we know it. Look here, it is. It's the movements from White Crane combined with Yu Herbafa. If you don't know. Wang Shang Jai invented Jian Wu based on cave paintings that someone had discovered, ancient cave paintings of people in ancient China frolicking, moving like an animal freely. And that's what it's based on conceptually. But the movement itself, you can see here it is. Here's all this, this kind of fine joint articulation that you see. This single joint articulated movement that you see in White Crane combined with Yu Ha Ba Fa. So you take away that extreme isometric tension and you replace it with this much smoother much smoother kind of movement there's still tension because that's the way that we bring in intent into the body by triggering the muscles and bringing this kind of how, how many times does Wang Shang Jai or other each one masters have to say it's 50%, you know, that, that, it, that it's a combination, that elastic force means literally in Mandarin, the combination of relaxation and tension. How many times do they have to say it and yet you've still got people talking about just like extreme, extreme relaxation as if that's what you're looking for and somehow, somehow, some magic power will come up like that and people will fly away. Someone goes like that and someone goes... So it's a combination of relaxation and tension. And we really feel that in these small joint movements because we're having to move the joint. So our intent links into that movement and we can feel it. If we get that, we start bringing some... I think people don't like the word tension because it, 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 it implies 100% tension. So that's why we... But, but the word I, the word elastic to me implies too much too much relaxation so we don't really have a word that's in between so it's like 50 50 roughly speaking to get that and then when we use that 50 50 when we bring tension into the the musculature then our intent connects with our body on a much more much more somatic level of feeling that we can feel it this is why I've talked about before. It's so easy to visualize this mus this this kind of movement because you can just lie down and you can feel it. So it's, it's you have memories of physical movement, so you can remember the feeling in a way that you don't normally remember the movement of your body. And then you just bring in your visualization, and think about what you're doing. This is it. This is it, isn't it? This is the if you combine if you combine white crane with view her bafa, you get that. That's the, you know, it's as simple as that. However, when we want to use this kind of single joint articulation in far lead, then some slightly different things come into play. So we again, we need to break down this. We don't want the, the white crane where it's just, it's just, it's tense, it's so tense. And there's almost, there's almost no articulated force behind the posture. You can go and look at the, the movement, it's so robotic. It's, it's all in the small joint, it's all in the small joint articulation, which, which can work because this is a way of, of generating force. And this links into the idea of structural expansion and structural contraction. We've talked about structural expansion before. And structural expansion, this, I mean, it's a big thing. We talked about it being a big thing, like we can, you know, open the whole body and get the whole body into it. But this also is structural expansion when we just go like that. And this is structural contraction when we go like that. And just in exactly the same way as this is structural expansion and this is structural contraction. And you can see this is opening, this is closing, 
this is structural contraction. It's the same principle, just on bigger or smaller levels. But what we can do, what Wang Shenzhai does, is he recognises that you can take the white crane kind of movement. Um, you can make it bigger by using this idea of articulated force. So there's more going on behind the movement. So you can just do that on its on its own like that, or you can you can get. You can get your whole body into there and articulate the movement in multiple different ways. It's quite awkward to do it like that. And that's one of the reasons why you bring it into Jianwu because it becomes a lot easier to set up the articulation of the, of the move. See there, like just sling shot round back into the... And what you see there is how this is then brought into push hands that the movement of the the movement of the hands in push hands isn't just about well this is just an exercise and you want to be able to release force from anywhere what you're doing is setting up the articulation of the so i want to as i'm doing push hands, so so i'm here and i move and i see the movement is setting up the just using small joint articulation with the like that but there's so much articulated force behind the movement so it's not just about the it's not just about whole body movement it's not just about articulated force now it's about setting up the articulation it's about how we move into that posture so you start kind of thinking about this a little bit in Jianwu usually you're training these things all me or very often you do push hands before Jianwu anyway but the idea is you can really think about how do I set up how do I set up the articulation for a small for a small movement? You know, just getting a massive amount more structural expansion, structural contraction into these small joint small joint movements. We don't want to get straight into that straight away. We want to think about just small joint movement on its own at first as opposed to screwing force so screwing force where we use this kind of getting the screw on the whole body but usually when we use small joint manipulation the the articulated force behind it is usually using some kind of screwing force in the in the body anyway but we can just think about very simple movements like hitting in like that here it's set on the back foot like that and i'm using this it's just kind of fishtail farly like that. Setting out like. You can press, see the hole, and it's it's closing, because see my hip is going, the fishtail farly is turning the hip in, and the hand is coming in like that. So there's your oppositional force. It's not just, it's not just the, the, the hand. One of the things that very tense, isometric tension does in, white crane is give the sense that the whole body is in the posture because if i do that and i tense my whole body i'm tensing everything and then do that because i'm tensing everything my intent goes into the whole of my body and when i do the posture it feels like my whole body is in the posture really that's an illusion that's something that wang shang jai recognized that's an illusion it can because it's tense it can transmit force so that idea of the the dog shaking off water is is there because the body is tense in it and if you get enough power in the movement it can kind of shake the posture a little bit but the articulated force that is real whole body connectivity the kind of thing you see in the, the kind of thing you see in like the seed is in Liu He Ba Fan the seed of it is in is in Tai Chi Chuan but only like the real top level people get it the use of articulated movement rather than just tense okay I tense i tense i do that it feels like my whole body is is involved in a movement because i can feel my whole body because it's ten tense it's an illusion what i want is the articulated movement so here's the screwing force look at the screwing force in my hips in fact going around while i'm not going to do that right in front of you move back one it's my sexy dance move yes it is such as i've got one and the whole body is in and here's my 
screwing force with the, with the arm this way, even though it's structural contraction, that's just, just one of the complexities. These are very often hybrid movements. This still goes back like that as if it as if it's opening, but they're coming close, they're staying, they're staying next to each other like that. They're not opening like that. They normally do in, in an opening movement. So I'm, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna this part of my body's gonna fish tail like that, round, and this is gonna come down like that into the into the posture. So so first of all I do it without any screwing force in this hand. The screwing force here like that, like that, and I just hit like that. And we can then hybridize that as a, what a funny noise you're making. We can hybridize that and put screw force into the, into the posture then. So we can just change it like that. Put some screw force. And here's the movement where the movement stops. Here's where the movement stops, where we truncate the movement as if we're actually hitting an object like that. It doesn't go past that. So even on the air, we truncate the movement here, but it doesn't make any difference if there's an object there. We hit it with force, just exactly the same posture. It's just that we never go past that truncation point. And then we've put all our elements together. I would argue that this kind of small joint movement like this comes more from Tai Chi. It doesn't really matter, does it? comes more from Tai Chi. This big overall movement comes more from Liu He Ba Fa, this big open posture and the small joint, the small joint articulation of the, this, this posture comes from White Crane and just this kind of rotation of small joint manipulation from Tai Chi and articulated, articulated force comes from Tai Chi and then uh, Liu He Ba Fa. Tai Chi and Liu He Ba Fa, I mean, it's all linking together, isn't it? And then the, the rotational far leap around the axis, like that. Ult ultimately, it's a concept that's going to come from Xing Yi Chuan and Bagua, so both using mostly Bagua for that kind of rotational far leap, I would think, but you can't, you can't track it down exactly. It's a heuristic, you know, there's all these elements that are kind of foundation elements that are seeping through in different parts of Wushu that Wang Sheng Jai is putting together. And then we can change that posture into a double hand. So that, that's the posture we use all the time when we're, when we're going for the guard. We're going to take down the guard and go in for the, it's absolutely classic each round. Going for the, going for the guard that way. And you can practice like that. So just, and using our more, our freer movement that we started looking at. And just visualizing where's that guard. It's particularly useful if they're of Southpaw or they're in the opposite stance to you. They've got that hand out and change. Practicing it like that. Just trying to get this. Just try to practice it like that. And if you want to practice it more for push hands, you can just do the kind of standard like that. And just think about. The problematic change is slightly like if you're just going to take one hand down, you're just keeping this ready to go this way. But if you're doing push hands, you can then combine both. So imagine you've got a hand on, two arms, right? So you're pushing one like that, or the other way. Ooh, he's going. And pushing the other way. Just or any angle you can think of if you're doing push hands and you're using this kind of artist, you can just practice, you know, how you're gonna. It's just small release of force, and what you've got to do is not is, is disappoint the expectation that someone's gonna go flying when you do that. If you're dead, dead lucky and they're off balance, that will happen, but that's not what it's for, it's for sudden shocking, shock and awe that in that split second when they go like, when you go like that and they go like that, that's your somatic timing being brought into a more practical, so that's when you change for the, or, or like, that's when you change to that. They just go like that for a second and as they pull back with your somatic timing, you go to like that into the push. And that's it, you know. But even a push, you know, very often doesn't do anything. You can follow up and follow up and bully. 
the, the only thing with that is too often we see people in each one with no defence whatsoever so once they've been pushed then they start getting bullied and then they just go like that and they go like that apparently that's like 95% or more of good each one push hands videos are unfortunately ruined by being like that there's such a skill differential and the person just gives up and goes like that don't do that if you practice push hands so what someone pushes you keep pushing me along and push you back you know stand your ground stay get involved hit back push back don't give in and particularly not if it's a famous master particularly don't give in you know make people respect you make them respect you don't give them the um don't give them fake respect i can remember my own teacher getting really really angry about this and saying like, like demanding to know not not that we weren't trying our best in sparring but demanding to know are you going easy on me because he's small smaller than us are you going easy on me because we because i'm smaller than you don't go easy on me you know like you've got to be like that you know make people respect you so similarly we can do so all these small joint articulation farley we can use for push hands or, or, or they come into their own they all come into their own in different kinds of what we call guard breaking or guard engaged postures and that's why you need to practice them very very seriously like just just working on but thinking about i mean it's 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 fine level bodily control like we've looked at in the previous couple of videos using this articulated whole body movement to get the force into such a small movement and just practicing like this moving forward moving forward and then moving backwards and all our different all our different steps front hand and back hand and then thinking about what you do using the, the multiplier effect to add things together so thinking about i'm going to hit um, like i did then hit then i'm going to grab hook the arm back and then change into the like that and you should feel it here you should feel the truncation point where we hit the we hit the lock point here and it truncates here so it's like we've hit something that point should be in absolute harmony with the set the set of the of the root and you can hear it if i you can hear the the two sets as i go one two with the and that's because here that's where the the posture solidifies, I hit the target, then I hit the target and I hit the arm and then I hit the face. And that's what solidifies the, the power. The power doesn't come from the floor, it's just set from the floor, so it solidifies the, 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 the consistency of the, the hit. Then you practice backhand. And you practice backhand and change into something else. Look at the structural sympathy because we're going like that and then change back into the it's very complementary it's not quite complementary routing because the, the feet are kind of flat as we're moving forwards but nevertheless the structural sympathy in the upper body movement is very strong for, for this kind of movement and these are all about thinking about where is your opponent's guard and you're just going to take it down and then you're going to drive through and hit drive through beginning with the guard the guard takedown so how do i it's what sometimes it's called bridging and people are always like how do i do that and well most of it is because you don't dare they've got their guard up what well, particularly guards that are out like this that are longer out like that instead of doing this which is quite commonplace now try to close down that kinetic force you see it all the time in mma instead of, instead of like trying to hit with the fingers like that try and hit with this part of the or the palm of the hit with the palm of the hands it's very it's the same movement it's just not quite as solid you just keep it truncated like that so you don't go too far and then thinking about what is the and even if we go like that it's, it's it's not got quite the strength, the same structural sympathy. So a little bit more because we've got to use more of our this kind of somatic timing where we was one two that way, and also the somatic timing. The muscle goes down and then forward, so it's a different kind of somatic 
somatic muscle bounce. It's not just like one, two, like that. It's one, two, it's going to go down and then up. But we use that, we use that as an extra bit of articulated force. Remember, the articulated force creates creates bigger movements from micro movements of them, very small movements of them, the body and muscle linking together. So if we go like that, the muscle comes down more, then it can go up. So there's just this extra space here to create more, to create a little bit more force. And we exploit every single little bit. It's all about the intense searching the body for where is force stored. So when people talk about this idea of stored force, some of the glass theory that they come out with is just like, this is the real thing. The body searching every little bit of its anatomical movement to find where is there a little bit of force that I can add into this posture. The intent scouring the body and doing that in the in the split second moment. So there's we use the somatic timing, one two, like that, where it's one two, hit, relax, and then straight back into the posture. And we use a little bit of articulated movement. The moment the muscle drops down the hill like that, we can get we can get this little you know, the, the, the shoulder can do this so it can get this extra can get this extra generation of force from the shoulder in which makes a big difference in the in the posture you can feel it scientifically get on the bag punch the bag and think about just using little movements like this that's what we're trying to learn how to do so you can see me doing that that with the posture I'm taking the taking the guard down and using that using that to feed into the structural sympathy is with the articulated force like that, feed into the articulated force. And I can do it differently, I'd say I do it with the, the, the lead hand because it's definitely a lot easier. I can do it differently, I can do it with hit and flow. So like that. We see I have to use the compensatory force that comes from a step because now I've lost the articulated force. I mean, I don't have to can do that but it's it's weak hit and, hit and flow is weak one two you've only got half the movement so you're already here you've only got half your stored force to change into the, the punch but you use compensatory force use a step and this is what shingi chuan is based on these movements are very small very limited amount of force generation so using a step as compensatory force and that's very much like like it's a rule of thumb for using hip and flow that you, you tend to use a step for compensatory power. And that'll get around the fact that you haven't got the articulated force behind it. Like that. And it's fast, that's the... And the, the smaller the gloves or no gloves, the closer you are to hitting with bare knuckles, the more the rule comes into play of the, the toughness of the striking surface relative to the, the the toughness of the target or otherwise so straight into the face bare knuckle that's enough power with the whole body weight behind it and if you can then get it we don't usually do it like this because you're not usually this far away but if you can get it with this kind of bigger step like that that we've looked at before the one two three like that it gets it all in one flow you can get more force in it like that. Like that. Mate, go out for a wee in a minute. Well, I'm not going out for a wee, you can go out for a wee. Go on, move, 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 move. Move, 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 move. Go on, because I've got enough time today. I've still got to go training anyway. So, for the backhand, it's the same. The same thing. The posture just stacks, see, it's just stacked a little bit on a lean like that, that's to generate more power in the pump, so that's the intent making that decision. So we're hitting and flowing like that. It's stepping out a little bit for the classic each one, one, two, three concepts. Now you see why you train that, particularly in the hours each one. So like that. Still using a little bit. I'm thinking about hit the guard, hit the guard, take it down a little bit and then in for the punch. We'll try to use more hip and flow. Like Big step. Like follow on with the see very much like a shingy tran step when I follow on like that. And it's exactly the same concept if we use use the double like like that. 
just just step in. But practice it in lines like this, moving forward and backward. And usually the, the favour the favour of the movement is to this way, like round like that. But it doesn't have to be, so you've got to practice both ways, if you see what I mean. Like so I'm gonna favour this hand by going that way, but now I'm gonna favour that hand by going that way. And you practice different things for so they're just micro adjustments in the way the posture is stacked. So usually I've talked before about the, the power of the intent to be just triggered by something that, it, that it's seen and that, that's beyond conscious thought. It sees something. Usually I've talked before about this phenomenon where we can just, if we just start talking or thinking about something, our body kind of does that in each round. And that's, that's the problematic thing with developing this skill. That what, what we want is the intent sees the opportunity and that just triggers the response. So let's say we're gonna go, I'm gonna do it this way. I'm gonna change it to there. I feel like we just did that, so. I'm changing it to just shift out half hook like that. So off the spot, not too much step. And then we get it, practice it in lines, but then start practicing it. Just move like that. Taking down the guard as it comes in. Or it could be a punch. But we're thinking particularly about we're going to take down the we're going to take down the guard. And this is one of the reasons why we very often have our hands up more than forward like that. So this rule of hear people talk about like it's like it's the tyranny of glass theory. Like people who don't actually do any sparring or fighting or training or fight trading, saying like the hand must always be pointed towards the face. <laughs> and you. I like hear people from Yao's each one saying that, and then you look at all the, the way it, all the senior Yao's people spar, such sparring as we do see. It's always up like that. It's up, it's up. It's up so you can catch. It's not so easy to catch if their, their arms are there. I've got to come up and over like that to catch them, so we keep them up like that. Um, you know, just like the same thing in Muay Thai, like you want to catch the, if you possibly can catch them. Harry before it get, before it gets through. So half half hook, half jab, just shifting around somewhere between the two with a little step out like that. And the more you can get on, see the articulation of the moon. If I do it slowly. It's not even both to go like that. One, two, three, like that. See if you can spot that now. If I put it down. One, two, three. See how the articulated somatic flow generates force. It's like a slingshot movement. It's not one, it's not one, two, one, two, three, like that. It's much more sophisticated movement concept than the naked eye can usually see. I'll do it slow so you can see what I'm doing. Now do it full speed, see if you can spot it. It's hard to see. And that, by the way, is the, the practical manifestation of the idea of a dog shaking off water or that kind of energy. Because it's about disrupting the other person's balance as well. Even just from the arms, just one, two. One, two. Going one way, going the other, like just, just knocking them a little bit off balance like that. It's almost nothing, it's just like a little vibration movement. But the idea isn't to make them go flying, it's just to discombobulate for a split second while you come through into the it's like, oh, which way am I going? One, two, three. Their, their intent will pick it up even if they don't consciously pick it up. And it's like, oh, where am I going? One, two, three. One, two, three, like that. So we have lots of guard breaking movements that, that don't involve this kind of small joint articulated force. So we'll look at those another time. We'll just stay focused on this, this concept today. So we can change now to the, to the hitting out like that posture, hitting out with the, with the wrist. And we can just use oppositional force like that. So we practice it off the spot. Something like, in like that. One, two, and the idea always in each one, and it can be a little bit over it, but let's say I push out an arm like that, 
and I remain in contact with the arm as I as I hit. So as I'm releasing force that way, I'm also pushing their arm out, which can turn their body a little bit and just discombobulate a little bit. It's actually not quite so easy to do against someone who's really strong and who knows what they're doing as it is to do against a helpless, a helpless youth or middle-aged practitioner who's just turned up at the gym in China. And we do see too many videos like that, I'm afraid, where there's someone completely helpless who's being manipulated like this. The, the rationale is usually like, yeah, but it's just some, just training for some thug on the street. That's not good enough. We've got to train for how does this work against like the, the highest level. That's how we've got to think. But we articulate again, we can just practice it on lines. You can move forwards and backwards and do all the different foot, footwork that I've looked at. I haven't got enough time in one video to do everything. So so from here, the hand is flat as per usual, but it's got, like, like the rule of this is it's got stored force that we can exploit. And that stored force is just doing that. It's, it's nothing until we articulate force behind the small joint movement. So, it, because it doesn't have to, like we can generate force like that and hit with the forearm, any part of the body, we can even hit with this part of the body or the shoulder. It can be anything along, along that line. But now we're thinking particularly because when we take down their guard, we usually don't want to be too close, but we could be wrestling that and just create a small little movement. So this is the other thing people don't get. This is far more interesting than magic power bullshit where you go like that and someone go, goes flying away. You're wrestling like that and you just create, you use your whole body to create a tiny little space like that where this hand can get in and punch. And you use your whole body articulated force to get power into that punch that looks like nothing. And that movement's going to like... See the somatic timing, making it a compound movement. It looks like one movement because of the somatic timing is so fast. But it's one, two, like that. From one, two, bouncing to the compound the movement. Compound, compound the movement like that, Expand, structural expansion like that, just using the back of the, the back of the wrist. So I can practice just off the spot like that. Looks, looks like nothing and we change into the whatever it is that we need to do. Or you can visualize things like, again like for push hands like you, this is on the inside of their arm, this is on the outside, like, like that kind of move. And all you've got to do, if you can just get them a little bit off balance and then change, punch or push, then you can maximise the force effect, not the force, the force effect by doing that. So we can, you can just do... Like, I said before, like the, the danger with postures like this is getting the fingers back up like that to push in time so that you don't stub the fingers. That's why it can be better to just go straight into the punch or something like that. Even in push hands, you're better off in push hands anyway, like wearing body protectors and head guard and proper going for it. It's more realistic anyway. So, all like that. And we can use it like similar sort of things, like if the if your arm is on their neck like that, across their neck, and changing the little push like that. And we don't need to have a massive effect from it. Just a micro movement that just allows the next posture to get in. That's all we need. That's all we're trying to do. It's just the short, sharp power of the movement. Just discombobulates someone for a second, creates the opening, and we're in. Like that. Just articulated, articulated movement like that. There's no screen force in that at all. There is in that, in the elbow, but there's not in that apart from the... There is in the rest of the body, but not in the movement itself like that. And we could change it and use screen force, so that's another interesting. So using the back of the arm and changing up like, like that and hitting in this way. The, the problem with this posture is like, what do you do next? It's like, it's a bit like in snooker. You know, you can pop the red ball, but when do you, where do you get a colour from? So you're kind of limited to this posture, which is a bit because the wrist is so bent, even though this posture always has a bent wrist, this planting fist, 
it's a bit of an awkward one to get into there. But it's useful for just manipulating and manoeuvring people up. Just moving the arm and changing to like, for example. You know, this is underneath their arm, this is over the top. One, one, two, into the, into the upper foot. This is all the kind of things you see, particularly in Yao's each one, the use of this small joint articulation finally to manipulate people. But what you've got to look for is the articulated movement behind the small movement, the way that's linked into the routing and how that constructs together into an overall configuration that is stacked in a very strong way that really maximizes all the bits of stored force in the body. Whether that push hands practice has gone a bit too far away from the reality of the context of modern fighting is a whole other question, but the principles are right. And similarly, you can use double and change into whatever it is you want to change into the posture to. Um, whatever it is you want to do. It's getting that somatic timing in the one, two is the and, and linking it correctly with the, the way that the posture is set. That's the skill set. But practicing it slowly, like first slowly, very slowly, and then very relaxed. Whichever one you're doing, very relaxed, and then just bringing up the bringing up the speed and the power. And you can practice this. You can get like a a tree branch and put your arm on like that. It's usually put a cloth on it or something because it doesn't take the skin off. But lots of these you can practice just on a bag, just getting the feeling. Just be wary of the the point that's hitting the hitting the bag. You don't want to do this ridiculous thing of over of hurting it, basically. Like it doesn't have to be that tough to be practically useful. You don't have to do this kind of hard qigong thing and get cauliflower wrists. You don't want cauliflower wrists. That's not necessary, but you can practice lots of things around this, like on the bag and hitting in this way, the small joint manipulation. And there is a little bit, even if you do the, even if you do the, the forearm push, there's a little bit of pull back like that in the, in the movement. It's also good for chin that and stuff like that. So those are our basics to practice. One in and out like that are two. Are two very basic kind of white cream postures, but there's also that we see as well this kind of very common posture like that. It's exactly the same idea, only it uses down. So the articulation of the movement circles to so spiral and then down like that. If I'm if in all of these postures I've talked about before, you can't see it unless your eye is trained for it, but you've always favouring one hand over the other when there's two hands. So and it's, it depends which way you move usually. So if I move to my left, I'm favouring the, the the right hand. If I move to my if I move to my right, I'm favouring the left hand. So it's the same posture, but it's set differently, and the routing is different, and that will transmit more force. This is what I start talking about at the beginning of the video. Like, okay, you create force, you've got the right body consistency then how do you direct that force to one particular part of the body? And often that can be very subtle movements, very subtle changes in the way that the configuration is stacked. So if I stack it, stack it this way or stack it that way, it changes which way the, and as a general rule of thumb, like the, the hand is usually, is, for this kind of posture, it's usually in harmony with the back, with the opposite foot, so like that. You can even see like the, the way the, the movement is setting for this hand and the way it's setting for I was just going to do it individually man I'd set it that way and I'd set it that way for that hand and all, all the changes is the intent has got to decide which way is it going to set the posture and it's got to do it doesn't really want to do one like that because then we lose the articulated force in the posture and so again that's a good learnable point because you can see why why we don't just find a combination of the two, all that articulated force, because a spiral movement is bigger than just going, you know? It's what I said about with the stick, like the distance between two points like that. If you go like that, <laughs> there's more, you get more, therefore more power, but we want to put that behind the movement so that we don't lose the speed of the, of the attack. So if 
we just go straight down like that, we lose the extra power that we get from the articulated force. So we never want to do it like that. We want to do it like, like that. And then that just gives the intent, the puzzle of, well, which, which one is it? Very often it doesn't matter and it will make those decisions just based on what, what the opponent is doing or what the problematic is. With this, this kind of movement, we always have the, the issue of like getting back into a fist if we're going to hit rather than hitting with the, the fingers. That's, and you can kind of feel that straight away, like that you might not have enough time to get into a fist and you might stub the fist. So you can use these for different like elbows up, this kind of thing. Or into the, here's one where you really would be better off going for a push rather than a punch because you don't want to get there. Because the hands are already open like that, you can just go straight into push. And this is the kind of thing you see all, all the time in push hands where you, you know, you, if you do push hands, you'll know that like sometimes you're battling to get who's going to get both on top or something like that. So you can do a postulate. You can just use this articulate force. And, and the way that, well, it doesn't really matter which, which way you favour in terms of the way that you set the posture, but some ways are, are easier for the, for the intent to flow, to flow with. To be honest, I don't, like, I don't consciously think about that. My intent just sets it the way. So it thinks he's right. So you can use that posture and in exactly the same way you can use, if you're on the, Underneath, you can use this kind of small joint articulation. So just like that's down, this uses this kind of nodding forwards posture, which is also down because the energy is going down like that. It's not rotational thoroughly. Unless you change it, then you start bringing in different, different angles like that. And you can do that for all of these, but think that's that's a discussion for another day so that's an introduction to this kind of small joint articulated force and you can look at that yourself and we'll bring that into some more movements another time and look at some more variations like on angles and combining with screen force and some different kinds of guard breaking techniques but I think that's probably enough to start with and start thinking about and start practicing okay that's enough for today thanks for watching as ever one love Keep training and I'll see you in the next one. Okay, treasure.